If they could have seen it as we are now, from a magical temporal helicopter, probably Imperial Rome would look just like this to its emperor. We are at the beginning of the second century after Christ. The emperor is the great Trajan. Rome is at the height of its architectonic splendor, the empire at the maximum of its expansion. The name of Rome dominates the known world of that time. The Mediterranean basin, eastern and western Europe, the African coast and the Middle East as far as the Caspian Sea. The culture the language and the extraordinary technology of Rome has transformed these primitive areas into rich and educated colonies. The city has a population of almost one and a half million and is enriched by hundreds of temples and glorious monuments. There is a network of nine aqueducts that supply the city with over one million cubic meters of water per day water which, amongst other things, is used to supply thermic baths with a total capacity of over 1,000 people. The heart of the city is where we are going now and corresponds with the panorama every tourist has admired from the terrace of the Campidoglio, the Roman Forum. A famous and fascinating area, which, with the passing of time, has crumbled and discolored, but at the time of the empire must have been a magnificent sight. Here the major part of public life took place. In the Curia, the Senate passed laws. In the basilicas, the courts administered justice. In the great temples, the gods were worshipped and in the great arenas, the dramas of anxiety and tension were played out. In the libraries, the records of a great culture were kept and passed on to future generations. It may seem strange that in this part of ancient Rome, where the emperors lived and all the public and state functions took place, Romans also came to play. For example, here, next to this important building, the Basilica Julia built by Caesar. Don't be fooled by the name Basilica. In fact, the Roman basilicas had nothing in common with the Christian ones which came later. They were enormous buildings used mainly for public functions, such as economic transactions, as in our modern day stock exchange. But most importantly, they were used for the administration of justice. Inside the Basilica Julia, Important cases were tried, attracting large numbers of people always in search of scandals. The Roman people, even though they were considered to be civilized, were extraordinarily litigious. And the rooms of this courthouse were never sufficient. The pauses between one hearing and another were often long. And so, to pass the time, large chessboards and other games were carved on the steps outside. These we can still see today. But come on, let's go inside. was absolutely enormous. More than 80 meters long, divided into five naves and, as was normal at that time, had no walls on three of the four sides. It was exposed directly to the outside world. Here, in fact, the tribunal of the Centumvirs operated. With the help of various partitions to divide the large space, four cases could be dealt with at the same time. As we said before, the trials were public, and when famous people were involved, the population flocked to the hearings. With noise and confusion that we can well imagine. We have seen that this part of Rome was probably the most crowded and chaotic. Nevertheless, not far from here, there was a place that no Roman would dare to enter. The Temple of Vesta. The Vestal Virgins, six young girls chosen from the noble families of the city, 
were the members of the only female Roman sacred college, the foundation of which dates back to the foundation of the city itself. It is possible that Rhea Silvia, the mother of Romulus and Remus, was a vestal virgin of the royal family. Their task was to maintain permanently burning the sacred flame conserved inside a small temple dedicated to the goddess Vesta. The inside of the temple consisted of a podium of marble, roughly 15 meters in diameter, at the center of which was a cell surrounded by Corinthian columns. The Vestal Virgin service lasted for 30 years, during which time chastity was obligatory. Those who failed to observe this faced the death penalty. In exchange, they had numerous financial benefits and great prestige. During the games and festivities, they were allotted places of honor, and on their deaths, tombs inside the city walls. They lived in a large building built around a courtyard and situated next to the temple. Here was a rectangular garden surrounded by a two-level columned arcade. Under the porch were the statues of the great Vestals, the senior members of the sacred college. Around the edges of the garden were the bedrooms, a kitchen and numerous bathrooms, all equipped with heating systems. One could describe it as a luxurious environment when compared to the austerity of Christian convents. Next to the area that we now call the Roman Forum, there began to develop, beginning in the first century after Christ, other forums, each one sponsored by the powerful person of that time. They were developed fulfilling a precise urbanistic plan, tending to create centers of common interest where the people could participate actively in public life. Therefore, they were considered very important by the powerful men of the time because it gave them the possibility to exercise and celebrate their power. For this, they would not hesitate to spend large sums of money. Even the great Augustus, the first emperor of Rome, wanted to build his own forum. In fact, it was built following a vow he made on the eve of the Battle of Philippi, in which Brutus and Cassius, Caesar's assassins, lost their lives. The Forum of Augustus was inaugurated in 2 BC. It was not as majestic as the one Trajan was to build later, but it boasted a splendid temple dedicated to Mars Ultori, which means the Avenger. The whole complex, which reached out to the Roman Forum, was destined to glorify the emperor and his power. This is where the Senate gathered to make declarations of war and peace. On its altars, governors made sacrifices before leaving for the provinces. Here were also erected the statues of victorious generals with carvings depicting the conquered nation. The temple was of considerable dimension, as can be seen from three of the original eight Corinthian columns, 15 meters high. In the temple, the priests of Mars celebrated various rites, and the building was also utilized by senators who, in special safes, kept their valuables. We must, however, wait another century to see the most spectacular of the forums, the Forum of Trajan built alongside the Forum of Augustus. When Trajan decided to create a center that would surpass in grandiosity all other constructions, the first problem to resolve was that of finding a suitable site. In keeping with his strong personality, which had brought immense success and wealth to the empire, he did not hesitate to flatten an entire hill, the one that existed between the Campidoglio and the Quirinale. 
The task was immense when we considered that the hill he flattened is the same height as that of the famous sculpted column, 30 meters. The Forum of Trajan was designed to resemble a Roman military camp and was built around a huge square 300 meters long and 185 meters wide. Because of its grandeur, it soon became one of the main administrative centers of the city. Laws were published here, foreign delegations received, elaborate imperial and religious ceremonies carried out, and conferences held. As we said before, the jewel of the Forum is the famous column, destined to conserve in a golden urn the ashes of the great emperor. The inside of the column is hollow, and a spiral staircase takes us to the top, which today is adorned with a statue of St. Peter, whereas in the time of the emperor, the statue was of himself. The column is completely covered by a frieze over 200 meters long, representing scenes from the two victorious wars Trajan fought against the Dacia, a people who inhabited what is now Romania. It is really a marble movie, to use the definition of Italo Calvino, a sculptural masterpiece which allows us to relive the various phases of the campaign. At that time, the column was surrounded by several buildings, a large temple dedicated to Trajan, and two libraries, from the windows of which it was possible to admire the scenes reproduced on the column. But the most important building in the Forum was the Basilica Ulpia, the work of the great architect Apollodorus of Damascus. The basilica was the largest in Rome, it measured 170 meters by 60. The inside was really magnificent. It consisted of five naves, divided by four rows of columns made from granite and cypolin marble. On the inside, around the top, was a large frieze representing victory in the process of sacrificing bulls or decorating candelabra with garlands of flowers. The floor was splendid harmoniously alternating geometric figures of polychromatic marble. This basilica too was not used for religious functions. Mass religious ceremonies in pagan Rome took place in the open. As we have seen, buildings like this were used as meeting places, or most often for judiciary functions, although special ceremonies like that of the freeing of slaves, were held by appointment in an area next to the basilica. The last basilica that we want to visit is certainly the most famous of those existing today. We once again find ourselves facing a magnificent building whose construction was started in the first years of the 4th century by a mediocre Roman emperor, Maxentius, whose name will remain forever tied to the fame of the building. But it was Constantine, who dethroned him in 312 AD after the Battle of the Milvian Bridge, who finished the building in grand style. The building, situated on the Sacred Way, halfway between the square of the Roman Forum and the Colosseum, covered an area of 100 meters by 65 roughly the size of a football field. There were two entrances. The grand entrance was located on the Sacred Way and consisted of a solemn portico made up of four huge columns and placed at the head of a flight of steps.
The central nave was more than 30 meters high and covered by three huge cross vaults resting on columns 15 meters high. The northern side of the nave ended in a vault on the inside of which were various niches for statues framed by small columns resting on sculpted brackets. In the apse of the central nave, there was an enormous statue of a seated constant which, with its 13 meters of height, gives a good idea of what must have been the height of the building. The interior was completed by two side aisles, each one made up of three rooms covered with heavy barrel vaults. The floor was splendidly decorated with polychromatic marble, and on the two floors above, there were huge windows to illuminate the room. Like other great Roman monuments, this huge building became, during the Middle Ages and the Renaissance period, one of the most plundered quarries for building materials. The last of these columns was removed in 1613 by order of Pope Paul V and placed in the square of Santa Maria Maggiore, where it can be admired today. It's getting late, and it's time we went to the Palatine. We've been invited by the Emperor, and as you can imagine, we can't keep him waiting. The Flavian Amphitheatre, whose construction was ordered by the Emperor Vespasian and was inaugurated in 80 AD by his son Titus, was the heart of the city and, because of its beauty, was destined to become the very symbol of Rome's grandeur. 100,000 cubic metres of travertine were needed to build it and a caravan of 200 carts a day shuttled in and out of Rome from the distant quarries of Tivoli for five years in a row. And yet, the builders managed to finish this enormous task in only eight years. No expense was spared to embellish this monument. The outer ring is almost 50 meters high and is decorated with hundreds of arches, each one of which was adorned with a statue. The aesthetic care shown by the unknown architects who conceived it is shown by the various styles of the heads of the semicolumns that flanked the arches on the first three floors. The first was stylized Doric, the second elegant Ionic, and the third refined Corinthian. But it's time to go in. The show is about to begin.
The inside is really magnificent and worthy of its fame. The dimensions are exceptional considering the time it was built. It is oval shaped. The larger diameter of the ellipse is 188 meters and the smaller one 156. The vaults covering the stairways are painted in gold and purple. The corridors paved with marble and decorated with mosaics and the partition walls are set with precious stones. The amphitheater could hold more than 50,000 seated spectators who in the case of an emergency could evacuate the stadium in a few minutes. The huge stadium was divided into four tiers, all seats carefully numbered and separated according to social status. One curiosity was that the women occupied the higher galleries, perhaps to avoid a promiscuity that might have led to serious disorders. Despite the size of the arena, the view from all the seats was perfect. A high metal net protected the spectators from possible assaults by the wild animals. During hot sunny days, the whole amphitheater was covered with a huge cloth cover which provided cool air and shade for the spectators. Its unfurling required tremendous effort, and even now its mechanism is clouded in mystery. Probably a huge metallic ring was hoisted by hundreds of ropes that pivoted on poles placed on the top of the external perimeter. Large cloth sails were then unfurled with amazing coordination by 1,000 expert sailors. And while the spectators got excited by the performances of the famous gladiators, under the huge wooden platform that made up the arena, a dramatic and frenetic hidden world organized the next show. Considering the technology of those times, which could count only on human labor, it seems incredible today that such a large number of wild animals could be handled simultaneously. Using a series of hoists and chutes, groups of animals were conveyed through the underground maze and finally into the arena, where they arrived terrified. At the end of the show, having reached their inevitable destiny, they were carried away and eliminated with the same efficiency and organization. We are almost certain that what the Romans never saw in the Colosseum was the slaughter of Christian martyrs. But thousands of gladiators died here. They were real war and death professionals, who often became the idols of the crowds and were jealously protected by their trainers, as they could earn a fortune for them. Let's leave this historical monument with the memory of those courageous men who were resigned to their destiny a moment that belongs to long-ago memories, but to which all mankind owes something.